99% of software engineers are making the same mistake and it's going to cost them their careers. And how do I know this? I worked at Microsoft as a software engineer. I worked with some of the best and the brightest people in the industry. And I've interviewed countless other engineers from big tech companies. You know, it's very easy to code, but it's harder to build software. And you don't learn to build software unless you're working for a, a bigger company. The best ones all shared the same trait, the kind of mindset that makes them impossible to replace, even as AI starts to replace more and more jobs. In this video, I'll show you exactly what they're doing differently and how you can join the 1% that will thrive in 2026. When you think of a doctor or a therapist or a firefighter, their job doesn't really change. A doctor diagnoses and treats illnesses. A firefighter puts out fires. Sure, technology evolves, but the foundation of the profession stays the same. You won't see a firefighter position transition to a therapist position, for example. Each of these professions have a solid foundation of what they are. You can probably see where I'm going with this. Software engineering is different, and that's why it was so in demand for the last decade. The output of the profession is always the same, better software, but the input, the tools and methods that you use is constantly shifting. Unlike medicine or firefighting, there isn't one set formula. And this is the key that the top 1% understand. You're not just a coder, you're a builder, and you have to build with whatever tools exist. Otherwise, faster and better builders will leave you behind. For the last decade, coding was that tool, but that's quickly changing. Take a look at the micro level. Tech stacks never stay the same. Within just five to six years, web development flipped entirely. From jQuery to Angular to React. And React itself keeps reinventing itself every few years. Hooks in 2019, server components today, whole specialties vanish or shrink in a single decade. And now, AI. Here's the thing most people miss. AI isn't new. It's existed since the 70s. But just like computers existed before the personal computer, what's changed is commercialization. For the first time, AI is accessible. It's easy enough for everyone to use. And once that happens, iteration explodes. Suddenly, we've got multimodal agents, specialized LLMs, open data sets with millions of entries. And anyone can plug in. And that's why the shift is as big as the internet. And the top 1% of developers already know this. They're not resisting AI. They're embracing it and they're building with it. Here's the harsh truth. Coding is no longer the most important skill to have. Systems engineering and prompt engineering have now replaced that. Think back to that little equation from earlier. For doctors or firefighters, the input is fixed. For software engineers, the input is systems engineering and prompt engineering now. That's the new coding. Here's the best analogy that I can give, writing research papers. Before the internet, you'd spend hours digging through books in the library. The internet made that step obsolete. You could just Google it now, but you still had to read, analyze, and piece everything together. AI is the next step. Now, instead of searching, reading, and comparing, AI does all of that instantly. But here's the catch. You still need to guide it through things. You still need to know the bigger picture. You need to know when to use authentication, pipelines, a firewall, a Kubernetes cluster. AI removes the grunt work, but you're still the architect. Let's look at an example of understanding system design in order to guide an AI. So imagine you tell an AI, build me an Uber clone. What you'll get back is chaos. A bunch of random code snippets that don't really fit together. But if you understand system design, you can guide it. So you know the system needs three core services, a rider service, a driver service, and a matching service. You also know it needs real-time location, GPS updates, a pub sub messaging system. It also needs a payment gateway and authentication, and it should be event-driven so riders and drivers can sync instantly. Now, instead of asking AI for an Uber clone, you can prompt, generate a microservice for ride matching that listens to a queue of ride requests and assigns the nearest driver based on location data from the rider and driver services. Suddenly, AI isn't guessing anymore. It's filling the exact part of the system that you've designed. That's the difference. Without system design, AI is a toy. With system design, AI is a really capable 
teammate. Do you see the difference there? You can't just ask AI to magically create something for you. You kind of have to treat it like your own personal Jarvis. Now, we covered a little bit about systems engineering, but what about prompt engineering? Well, in the previous example, you can see the difference between using a good prompt versus a bad prompt. Systems and prompt engineering go hand in hand. Even if you know a system really well, the kicker is you have to be able to communicate with the AI to give it an understanding of what you want to. That way it can use the guidelines that you have and build on top of that. Here are some examples of prompts. So let's ask the AI to make an e-commerce app. Yeah, that one's not so good. A better one might be generate a checkout service in Python that validates the user's shopping cart, connects to Stripe for payment, updates the inventory service after successful payment. That's a much better prompt and it gives the AI guidance on what you want. Let's look at another bad prompt. Create a chat app. We have no idea what that means. A much better prompt would be write a WebSocket based chat service in Go that handles authentication via JWT, stores messages in MongoDB, and supports real time broadcasting to chat rooms. So you can kind of see the difference between bad prompt engineering and good prompt engineering, and that is going to be vital moving forward as a software engineer. I mentioned earlier that being in the top 1% of software engineers means more than just writing good code. But what's most important is understanding things like systems and prompt engineering. Today's sponsor, Zero to Mastery, is actually one of the best places to learn those skills. They've got in-depth courses like the Prompt Engineering Bootcamp and the AI Engineering Bootcamp, where you'll learn how to use coding assistance in real-world software engineering contexts. They cover everything from the basics of LLMs to building actual apps and games to working with transformer models in different prompting frameworks. And it's not just one or two classes. ZTM's platform is constantly updated with new relevant courses. You can track your progress, build projects, and even get career advice directly from instructors. What I also love is that it goes beyond just video lessons. On the left side of their platform, you'll find onboarding guides, a super active Discord community where you can connect with other learners and ask questions to other instructors, and even content on life skills that software engineers actually need in 2026. I'd highly recommend checking them out. I've included some links in the description below. All right, so let's get back to the video. The other thing 99% of people do is always go for the no-code solutions. I strongly believe in no-code solutions as a starting point or an MVP, but they're not always the best option for enterprise software. The closest tool that I've seen that can handle enterprise software is Augment Code. I did a video about it in the past. It's basically a VS extension that'll index your repo and add tests, refactor things, install missing dependencies, add entire features. It's honestly amazing. But all that being said, you need to understand what's happening. To an extent. Otherwise, you can never correct the agent or validate that what it's doing is appropriate for your situation. Maybe it solves your issue in the short term, but then it introduces another issue of storing data in memory rather than using a database, or maybe it just creates a test to pass and doesn't actually test meaningful edge cases. Repos can be made up of thousands of files and hundreds of thousands of lines of code. There's a lot of nuance when it comes to interacting with entire systems. Changing code is easy but understanding that logs are at capacity or that concurrency is broken or a cluster keeps going down, those details are all really relevant to keeping a code base healthy and functional. Human intervention still needs to be there at the end of the day. There are really great tools like Cursor, Augment, GenSpark, Claude, you can all use these at your disposal to give you a leg up with the code, but blindly trusting them to just do the code for you will make you replaceable. If you can ask something else to just do it for you, why can't anyone else do that? You need to stand out from others without relying too heavily on template solutions that pretend to have all the answers. So here's the takeaway. By 2026, the real edge in software engineering won't be about how fast you can code or how many frameworks you've memorized. It'll be about how well you can think in systems engineering and how effectively you can guide AI. The bottom 99% will keep doing the same thing, relying on code alone or leaning too hard on no code solutions. But the top 1%, they'll use AI as leverage and understand when to use it and when not to use it. They'll design the system, craft the right prompts, and understand the trade-offs. They'll know when to trust AI and when to step in with human judgment. That's the difference between being replaceable and being irreplaceable. So if you want to see yourself get ahead of 99% of software engineers, stop seeing yourself as just a coder. Start seeing yourself as an architect the one who guides, directs, and builds with whatever tools exist, whether it's code, no code, or AI. Because in the next few years, the people that master this mindset will be the future of software engineering. And the question is, will you be one of them?